Welcome back to 20 Life Learners. Our speaker for today is Isma Tubalbe. She is a fifth year medical student at UCT. Born in Togo to Ghanaian parents, Isma has always had a passion for healthcare, particularly African healthcare. This passion goes beyond studying, however, as her exposure to family members not getting access to the healthcare they needed in Guinea has prompted her to invest in this passion more. For the past couple of years, she has traveled to various healthcare centers and hospitals in Guinea, Senegal, and Ghana, as well as South Africa, to better understand how treatment is done in those countries. Along the way, she has learned many lessons and has gained a better understanding for what is needed for healthcare to be accessible to all, as it should be. She shares her journey, experiences, and so much more. So good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining this evening, and happy Heritage Day. Um, this evening, I'll be presenting on my experience with navigating healthcare in Africa, how it has shaped me and the lessons that I've learned. Just a disclaimer that I'm not a medical expert. My name is Isma Tubalde. I was born in Lomwe, Togo in 1997 to Guinean parents. I'm one of four children and we are Fulani, which is one of the biggest ethnic groups in the Sahel and West Africa. We are known for our nomadic lifestyle. Um, we grew up in a very Muslim and traditional community. My father was a, a farm boy, so he did a lot of herding up cattle and looking after crops. And my mother was a city girl um, from a, a more affluent background. So she had a formal education until grade 11. When I was born, we moved to Luanda, Angola, with the hopes of migrating to the States for a better life. But in 1999, my uncle Amadou Diallo was killed by police in New York. 41 bullets fired is enough to traumatize any family. So my father went on to search for a better life for us in South Africa. So in 2001, my pregnant mother and I traveled to South Africa. But on our way to our hotel, we were hijacked. Not really the best welcome, but everything was taken from our clothes to our money to passports. And we slept in the clothes that we traveled in. So a young foreign family that doesn't speak English, no family in South Africa, and now with no passports, would prove to be a very difficult journey ahead. My mother describes me as a very empathetic and independent child. From a young age, I learned the importance of language. I took on the responsibility of looking after my younger brother while my mom prepared our home. I quickly learned to fill in my school forms and explain the formalities of school to my mother who was still learning English. But my work ethic really comes from my father, who worked really hard abroad to get us what we needed. So this is the first time I tell the story on a public platform because I can't really tell my story without telling the story of my parents. My parents took the work hard, play hard, very literal. So we went to school until 2 p.m. Then we had Muslim school until 5 p.m. And then we had French classes until 6 p.m. and did all our homework. But in the same breath, we rode our bikes, did extracurricular activities on the weekends and swam with our cousins. I would date back my interest in medicine to when I was in grade two. We had just done a project on water pollution and litter and how it affects drinking water for, for, for people and children. And there was always pictures of these very malnourished children in our books. I remember going home and having to explain cholera and littering to my mother. And that's when I was introduced to what she said in French, pediatrician. So we had to do a speech two weeks later on what we wanted to be when we grew up or do a show and tell. I remember going into the dictionary and finding the word pediatrician and saying, yes, that's what I wanted to do. So I made a speech and I was later asked to present 
the rest of the school. So as you can tell, I was really excited and I haven't looked back since then. With great interest in first aid. I joined the International um, St. John's Brigade and competed for first aid and home-based care nationally. But healthcare became really personal to me in high school as well. In high school, my grandmother and my uncle were both involved in an accident in Guinea. And they could not get help in Guinea. So they had to go to either the neighboring countries or come to South Africa. I vividly remember just how, um, how everyone at home would become so panicked when someone back home in Guinea was sick. We'd have to clear a room, flights needed to be booked, private hospitals needed to be called. And I remember being very frustrated that something as simple as healthcare, something a right has become a commodity. So that's when I really decided that medicine is what I wanted to do. So I think in the story, my main point is to understand narrative. How do we get where we are? How my different identities intersect and the power of telling stories and the power of listening to stories. So now people see the fifth year medical student, but the story goes beyond that. In grade 11, I went to see a career guidance counselor, very confident that I wanted to do medicine, but um, when we have to apply, you always have to put your plan B, which I didn't have. So we went to see a career guidance counselor. I wrote an aptitude test. Um, and after the test, you sit in a room with the, the guidance counselor and then your parents. So I was with my mom. And I remember the guidance counselor asking me, um, uh, what do you want to study? And I said, medicine, confidently. Um, and he's like, yeah, I think you should go to university. You will do very well. Um, surprisingly, your aptitude test says you'll do well in business, um, which is great because I hadn't done any business in school. And then the next words that he said were, I don't think you should study medicine. In fact, he said, do not apply at UCT for medicine or anything else. Um, I should rather do family law industrial psychology, um, and so on. And I remember walking out of there extremely disappointed. Not only had I made my mother book an appointment and pay for a career guidance, but he had told me that something that I've wanted to do my entire life was not something I'd be good at. So as we walked out, my mom said, um, you came here for your option B, right? I said, yes. So that's what you're going to apply for as your option B. So my first option was medicine, and I put everything else that he said as my option B. And when we spoke about it a few days ago when I was preparing for this presentation, she said, you were so disappointed. We both were, but I had faith in you, and I had faith in God. And here I am, a fifth-year medical student at the University of Cape Town. So when we talk about journeys, um, it's so important to just reflect a little bit. And I remember my first and second year in medicine, just when people were talking about how they got into medicine, their journey, their distinctions, all the achievements, I always found myself saying things like, oh, I just slipped through the cracks. Like they got it all wrong. Um, I was waiting for a call to say, no, we made a mistake, we took someone else's position, um, pack your bags and leave. And so I was so focused in first year in my academics and not slipping up um, and not doing anything else but but school. And even by doing that, I, I still didn't achieve the marks that I wanted to achieve. And I felt like I couldn't call back home and say, I'm, I'm really struggling. Like, it's, it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be because this is what I had fought for. And once I passed my first and second year, I realized that actually I am meant to be there. Um, this is what I've always wanted to do. 
And that's when I really started opening up and doing things that I enjoyed doing. So we find ourselves in a healthcare system in Africa. And I really enjoy this quote. It says, give people what they need, food, medicine, clean air, pure water, trees and grass, pleasant homes to live in, some hours of work, more hours of leisure. Don't ask who deserves it. Every human being deserves it. And we know that healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa remains one of the worst in the world. We have the highest mortality rates in the youngest population. And it's so strange that in 2020, we are still talking about access to healthcare. In South Africa, um, what we do best is to break down the Western system of healthcare because it doesn't work for us. We've taken on a more community-based health system with a better referral system. I'm not saying that we are 100% there, but we have one foot forward having conversations around global health, global surgery, and the importance of public health. We know medicine is colonial. We know medicine, historically, we know who accessed healthcare, who was able to access health, healthcare and who didn't. So the only way to improve global health is to improve access to healthcare. So the phrase health for all was coined um, in 1978 in the Alma Ata Declaration. And these are some of the principles of health for all. Accessibility, community participation, health promotion, literature, which talks about evidence-based medicine and intersectoral collaboration. We need to shift the phrase from a more ideal phrase to a practical phrase. And some of the things we need to prioritize in order to get to that is digital technology, resource distribution in the most equitable way possible, and a multi-sectoral approach, and not forgetting leadership. So we've heard all the issues around healthcare in Africa, but I was really concerned. I, I wanted to see it for myself. So in the end, at the end of 2018, I joined the Rural Support Network, which is one of the societies at UCT. And we um, stayed in Eastern Cape, rural Eastern Cape, in the Malamli Hospital for two weeks. Um, there was one doctor. It was the drainage area for TB patients in the district. The closest hospital for referral was three hours away by ambulance. So you can just imagine a pregnant woman that comes in who needs an emergency C-section will not get her C-section immediately, which means that the doctor needs to be able to tell three hours before that this is going to be an emergency situation and an ambulance needs to be called. It was very shocking to move from a place like Kutusky Hospital with all the facilities and resources to then a very rural, um, very different spectrum of healthcare where we saw patients that would literally have walked for two days to get to the hospital, take blood tests, have to go home and return a week later for those results and then to be referred. So when we speak about access, we're not only talking about distance, we're talking about how appropriate is that healthcare for that patient at that time? Is it of good quality? Um, and what other social issues are there that affect health? And that's why it's so important for us to talk about sectors. How can we collaborate with the transport sector? How can we con collaborate with the food, housing, education? Those are all things that impact people's health. Straight after that, I went back home to Guinea. Um, I was in Ignasi Dean Hospital, was one of one of our three national hospitals for a population of 13 million people. I spent a week in the surgical department. I had just finished third year, so entering my clinical years. So I didn't have much to contribute in terms of clinical expertise. So my job was mainly to just observe. And I just want to highlight a few of the, the good things about healthcare that I've seen. I think most of us know all the horrible things, we under-resourced, understaffed, 
poor governance. That's all very evident. Um, what I really enjoyed about Guinea was how dedicated and motivated the health professionals are. Under-resourced, yet they were doing tutorials at 2 a.m., working longer shifts um, in a country where the patient has to provide everything from gloves to medication to IV for themselves, their own bed sheets. It's a very difficult system to work in and to find people who can self-motivate themselves to get to the point where they're still prioritizing their patients, that is highly, highly commendable. The other important thing that I saw in Guinea was community that I hadn't even seen in South Africa. When someone is sick, the community takes care of its people. And I think that's why when Ebola hit us, um, it was known as the caregiver's disease because although it was a very, um, a very uh, a fatal disease, um, people still looked after those who were living and even those that were dead. Our burial process is, is our last act of kindness and care um, for the body. In July 2019, I went over to Senegal, which is one of our neighboring countries. I was there for a week with Youth for Global Health and Social Justice. And their main aim is to walk work on access to clean water and sanitation, um, particularly in Michigan, Flint, but um, internationally as well. Um, the one thing that I really enjoyed in Senegal is um, obviously seeing health professionals that look like me, giving care to people that look like me, speak the language that I speak, which was great. Another very innovative thing that I saw was that their waiting area for this particular hospital was outside with a concrete roof at the top for, sh for shade. This means less um, disease uh, contraction, decreasing um, disease spread. It meant sun for patients who have TB, better ventilation, and decreasing traffic in hospitals. And that's um, making medicine relevant for us. Of course, something like this couldn't work in a Western country where the climate wouldn't allow. For something like our, our place, it works very well. When you walk into the reception area in the obstetrics and gynecology, health promotion on all the walls, breastfeeding um, promotion, how to breastfeed, what milestones your kids should be reaching at specific ages, what vaccinations and when they should get it, all in the language of the patient that's attending the clinic or the hospital. In the waiting area, there was water and tea that was offered, and outside there was a lot of light coming in with a glass window and this big, beautiful green garden that was going to be renovated or turned into a post-op rehabilitation. So what I'm saying is that there are, there are good things in the African healthcare system, and all those good things are things that are context and relevant to what is needed in Africa. In December 2019, I opted to do my elective um, in Ghana. In medical school, in your final year, you get um, four weeks to do your elective, your long elective, in any department that you like or any specific hospital that you like. Obviously, I went back to East Africa because that's what I was interested in the, health, the West African healthcare system. In Ghana, I Spent two weeks in Chibi, which is a rural hospital in the eastern region of Ghana. Um, I was mainly in the obstetrics and gynecology ward, and I absolutely loved it. The people were so welcoming, it was heartwarming, and it was medicine that was for the people. Um, I remember just enjoying walking to calls at night, which is very rare for medical students, but. Um, it was understanding that you're going to go do work or witness work that was um, relatable and, and what we've all been waiting to see. So the one thing that I really enjoyed about TV was that um, they have a maternal book. So 
So in South Africa, you have a Road to Health book, which is given to women after they've delivered. And it's basically for immunization and warning signs for the child. But in Ghana, they give you a maternal book. So once you fall pregnant, you get a, a maternal book. And in that, it tells you how to look after your pregnancy, what foods to eat, what not to eat, the warning signs of pregnancy, what to prepare for the hospital. And then all your appointments in there. And then it carries on until you have the baby and six months after you have the baby with the immunization and all the signs. And something very little that makes a big difference in that book is that the pictures that were illustrated were of Ghanaian women and of Ghanaian men. The clothing, the color, even the foods that were recommended to eat were Ghanaian food, which makes a really big impact. You can't be telling Ghanaian women to be eating asparagus if that's not what's available in that country. Um, and if the food is like fufu and all that stuff, that's what they are eating. That's what should be recommended, maybe in different um, portions or with different alternatives that are available to the people. So after my two weeks in Chibi, I went to the regional hospital in Accra um, in the emergency department. And from the get-go, I was already in love. Um, the unit was run by a black woman. All the women, all the hot doctors that I worked with were black women. And it was also great to see a lot of black male nurses, which we don't really see in South Africa. Um, so that was very important for me, I think, for my self esteem as well, just to see that it is possible. Um, it was so great to see that. The main issues in the emergency were strokes, hypertension, diseases of lifestyle. Um, Ghana is one of the most, the most developed countries in West Africa. So I wasn't really surprised to see those lifestyle diseases. Um, but one of the contrasting things was the amount of violence. So in South Africa, when you walk into the emergency or trauma, it's a lot of gunshot wounds, stabbings, alcohol, violence. And I didn't really see much of that in Ghana. It's a more um, peaceful uh, country, the violence isn't, at least from what I've seen, not so great. Um, so it was, it was nice to work in that kind of environment. I felt safe. So with all um, stories and experiences, there are lessons that we can learn. This is my favorite quote at the moment by Fasifa Davids. In order to create a better society, we need to align our actions with the mission of service. So here are some of my learning points um, in my experiences and in healthcare. It's one that medicine is political. If anyone tells you that medicine is not political, they are not good health professionals. Number two, healthcare requires a system to deliver it. So do not build systems in an emergency. Build systems that can pick up and can respond to emergencies. Three, without leadership, even the best designed systems will fail. Four, if the patient is not the center of the topic, it is not healthcare. If your, your approach to healthcare does not have the patient in its center, it will fail. And then five, teach people to prioritize their health. A healthy population means a better economy, better politics and a better society. At the end of the day, that's what we all want, better society. And that means we need to advocate for that. As people, as people in health, healthcare, it is our role and our responsibility. Thank you to this week's Life Learner. Please stay tuned for our next video.